Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Ron, alcoholic. Ron. Sobriety date is December 28, 1985, which is a while. <laughs> Quite a surprise to me. And welcome to hot yoga. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they changed the agenda. I know I don't look like your typical yoga instructor, but you'd be surprised. We come in strange packages. Actually, I wanted to make a request. Those prayer warriors who were praying for heat last night, tell God he can wrap it up now. <laughs> I am absolutely delighted to be here to do what has become the centerpiece of my recovery for some time now. And Dave alluded to it. I'll say a little bit more about that. This is a workshop. So uh, we're going to do things a little bit differently, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go as well. Thank you to the committee for letting me come back. I was here in 2016, did a meditation workshop, and this is really a cool deal that happened. Well, okay, no, it's a hot deal that happens here. <laughs> there are some handouts that are sprinkled around. Uh, my my uh, longtime sponsor used to say that you don't need a handout for everybody in the room because only a third really want it, and uh, they don't need pens because only a third of those will write. But I'm sort of signaling something there. There's a reason they encourage us to write stuff down. The reason is because it doesn't stick unless we freeze frame it by writing it down. So you are encouraged to write throughout this workshop because it will help you retain, which may change your life. So I wanted to start with this before we actually get into the meat of this. What I heard at the early bird meeting, and I've heard a number of times, a lot of gratitude, a lot of appreciation. I think it's all wonderful. But I heard a lot about fun and fellowship, and I'm down with that. But I want to highlight something for you. So talking to a guy named, uh, he refers to himself as the drunk sheriff. Some of you know who he is, and uh, he's somewhere out there. And he, was, he and I were trading stories after the early bird meeting, and then at some point he said something like Dave just said, he said, yeah, I was, way into, I was way into recovery. I was working with people, doing the deal, as we like to say. And something just wasn't right. And despite me being a big old strong guy, I realized I had inner child to work, work to do. Now, if you don't know that, I'm not going to take you into that. That's a way of talking about this. You see, underneath drinking is a whole bunch of stuff that we clean up that then reveals a whole bunch more stuff that reveals cleaning up needs. That's the way the recovery program, these 12 steps, have worked in my experience, which is what I want to share a little bit about. And as soon as he began talking about the real work he had to do long into his recovery, he and I started having a different conversation, which is the one I want to have with you. It happened last night, too, for those of you who were here listening to what was an outstanding start to this conference, Tammy. Yeah. You see, she used a really, really cool speaking technique and set y'all up for the fall. Y'all know what I'm talking about? She was all dancing and happy and telling funny stuff and smiling and charming, and then she said, yeah, I'm that, I'm that woman who killed someone drunk driving. And you could feel the fun frivolity drop. It happened later when she told us about the forgiveness work. Well, in the big book, there's this great line that says, beneath our fun and frivolity is deadly earnestness, which is what I heard Robert talking about. This stuff kills. And in my experience, it's really easy to become complacent against our knowledge or participation in it. It gets good, it gets better, and suddenly we're cruising. The problem is, and Dave was alluding to this, is a lot of us get stuck. And we don't know what to do. My sponsor, longtime sponsor, Sam, it suggested that I go around and talk to people who'd gotten loaded after long-term sobriety, which y'all know it happens all the time, 12 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. Uh, and, and he said, watch their eyes. Don't listen to their mouths. Watch their eyes. Because what you'll see is mostly they don't have a clue what happened. It actually says that in the big book. If you ask any alcoholic why he drinks... If he's really honest, he's going to say, I don't have a clue what's going on here. Well, it's the same thing that happens to those of us who get stuck. And that's the place Bill Wilson was in in 1957 when he wrote an article called The Next Frontier. As he was suffering from the debilitating depression, 
He couldn't get out from under it. He believed in the steps, but he couldn't figure out why the steps weren't working. So a friend of mine says, what you need to know about the second step is it's a progressive step to offset a progressive disease, which means the restoration to sanity never stops. There's always a next layer of restoration of sanity. So wherever you are right now, me too, this is not as good as it can get. Because the restoration continues if I can work the steps, as you heard from all our speakers so far, at more depth, over time, more restoration occurs. That's emotional sobriety work. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a shorthand using big book language. What emotional sobriety means is that we can be placed into a position of neutrality with regard to people, places, things, and situations. Basically, all that stuff out there, including all y'all for me, all that stuff can be set to rest if we can do this emotional sobriety work using the same 12 steps. My uh, extremely cool spiritual teacher out in New Mexico, where I lived for many years, uh, she, uh, she has a 24-karat word for this. She calls it equipoise. So if you're a wordmeister, I think there's at least one in the front row who has a love of books. Equipoise is a six, just a 24-karat word for this idea of being placed in a position of neutrality. Think of it as the ability to be like on a high wire, and regardless of what the winds do and your balance does and the circumstances around you, think of it as the ability to maintain balance on the high wire, which is life. You all know this, presumably, right? Because things happen. Mike and I were just talking about one of his sponsees who's, who's just in a terrible, awful life circumstance right now. Happens all the time. Well, think of emotional sobriety as the ability to maintain balance, spiritual balance, recovery balance, no matter what. Now, if that's not enticing enough, I want you to consider this, and this is data I've collected for many, many years talking to people who went back out. It may very well be that for a lot of us, being able to find this way to emotional sobriety may keep us sober in ways that just working what we worked when we got here won't. I know that's heresy. I know that. But the reason I share that with you, and I'll tell you more about this in a moment, is because at seven, eight years sober, despite doing the deal, as we like to say it, sponsoring, being sponsored, therapy, doing service work, blah, 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 work the steps multiple times, I used to sit on a little cushion rocking back and forth like an autistic child asking God to kill me because I don't have enough courage to kill myself. And I always have somebody come up and says, Ron, you shouldn't share that stuff because you're going to scare off the newcomers, to which I say what I have learned is that some of you will find your way to one of these stuck places. And if you don't know, as Dave said, it's normal to get stuck. What's not normal is to know what to do with it. It's the steps, practiced at more depth, which is what we're going to talk about. So what Bill said, and this is summarized a little bit in the first page of that handout, is what he found within himself was what he eventually would call crippling dependencies. That, in my language, as I practice it now, that he made the mis mistake of thinking that his well-being was dependent on you, or his life, or his circumstances. And then he says something really incredibly profound. This is a guy who's 20-plus years sober, saying, even my dependency on AA can be crippling. That is a brutal piece of truth. But what he saw was as long as he placed his well-being, his ultimate sobriety, anywhere outside himself, he was setting himself up for the fall. Because as we heard last night in, this, in uh, uh, Tammy's message, at some point in time, those people are going to disappoint you. Life is not going to cooperate. There's a guy named Wayne Lickerman who wrote a book about this. It's really his name. He's in recovery. Wayne Lickerman. Um, <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's one of his best laugh lines. Uh, he says, let's be honest. You don't get what you pray for. You don't get what you want. You don't get what you need. You get what you get. Now, what are you going to do with that? 
life on life's terms would be our motto, right? We hear it all the time. And so this emotional sobriety work is about finding a way to live life on life's terms with a reasonable degree of balance. What it is not, however, is a denial of your feelings. Some of you like, well, if you're like everybody I know, some of you think that the ticket to emotional sobriety is to just deny or repress your feelings. There's evidence that doesn't work very well. <laughs> we call it coming out sideways, right? You repress those feelings at work and your spouse catches it at home. Or as we used to say, the big boss yells the little boss, little boss yells the worker, worker goes home, yells the wife, wife yells the kids, kid kicks the dog, dog bites the cat, cat pees on the bed. <laughs> yeah, the ripple effects of a lack of emotional sobriety. So let me just for a moment, just for a moment, because I do a lot of this work even in the professional world, not specifically the emotional sobriety, but there's something you need to know that is really incredibly valuable. In psychology, it's called the ladder of inference, which you don't have to remember. I just like to use big phrases because it makes me sound like I think I know what I'm talking about. Here's what it says, and I'll translate this to our language. You woke up this morning with a set of old ideas. I don't know if they're accurate or not, but you got them. In other words, you may be delusional. You may be in denial. You may be blind to certain things about reality that haven't made it into you yet. And you woke up that way. It's not your fault. You're not guilty of anything except being human. Shortly after you woke up with those old ideas, you encountered life. Unless you didn't wake, in which case we don't know what's happening to you. <laughs> You're not here, though. <laughs> uh, I was talking to a guy in recovery about this, and he told me the story about he, he, he got up one morning and his intention was really good for the day. You were sort of chatting about this, Angie, and, and what, what you had to say. And he had really good intentions for the day, and his first step on planet Earth was to place his foot squarely in the diarrhea his dog had left beside his bed. <laughs> And he literally went ass over tea kettle, down in it. And he said, Ron, the day just, I had a real hard time hitting the reset button after that. <laughs> so we bump, into, we bump into life. Life does what life does, life on life's terms. Well, here's why those old ideas are so important to us about emotional sobriety. However you view the world is how you will interpret that experience. And as long as you believe what you believe, you will continue to interpret the world that way. If you believe you're a victim, I don't know how many ways you'll get victimized, but that old idea will assure you get victimized. If you believe that you're invulnerable, I don't know how many hits you're going to take before life tenderizes you. As long as you believe you're invulnerable, life is going to pound on you. It's inevitable because it's a belief that won't hold up because life doesn't care about your invulnerability. If you believe you can't slip in your recovery, just talk to some folks. Some of us reach a place where we think that we're probably on incredibly steady ground, except powerlessness says it's not the insanity of the drink, it's the insanity before the drink, which means I am still at risk of that even though I have 34 years of sobriety. If I think I have a choice in that matter, that means I think I have control over a subtle foe. There's no evidence that's true. That should settle you. It's a life or death proposition, as we've heard. So we translate that story, our experience. Stories produce feelings. Feelings produce action. Now, one of the things I love to hear in meeting rooms, because my experience says it's not true for me, is, well, my sponsor tells me, this is like the voice of authority, right? My sponsor tells me that I'm not responsible for, for the first thought, but I am responsible for the second thought. You know, if you really road test that, you're going to find out it's not true. Let me tell you how I know this. Not too many years ago, someone cut me off in traffic. Anybody here, by show of hands, ever behave badly against your values, against your recovery principles when you're cut off in traffic. Come on, be honest. Yeah, there you that's pretty much all of you. It is the rare person who says, God bless you, right? As they drive you off the road. I had that happen to me. A guy cut me off scared. Man, it scared me. 
we were, we were going fairly fast, and I, I don't know, it was a matter of inches, and I didn't see it coming, it frightened me. And literally a few moments later, I'm like 17, 18, 19, 20 years sober. And I share these things because you need to know that 20 years sober people do stupid stuff. They really do. I'm living proof. Anyway, next thing I know, I'm driving 95 miles an hour chasing this guy down the road. <laughs> and I'm talking out loud about what I'm going to do to this lousy rut. And, you know, the problem is I'm a chicken and have been my whole life. I'm like the dog that's going to catch a car. I don't know what I'm going to do if I catch this guy. <laughs> And I try and talk myself off the ledge, and I fail. I am powerless at that moment. My story has been activated. My fear has activated a story which has produced feelings which I cannot control, which is producing action, which is (laughs) clearly unmanageable, clearly irrational. But I have no ability to modify it. All fueled by a set of old ideas about fear and some things like, how dare he? That, yeah, you know those words. One of my favorite stories actually happened. There's a particular intersection in part of Atlanta I live near that is really, really problematic on um, on afternoons when traffic's, there's probably some places like this around here, like the tunnel through, you know, that place. And, uh, and this was a Friday afternoon, and I had a particularly... Um, cool week with a lot to be grateful for. And so I, I come up to the end of this ramp, and I'm it, it's 90 degrees outside. It's 137% humidity, as it sometimes is in the South. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm at the end of this long, long... N- n- the odds are you're telling yourself a story right now. You're interpreting through your old idea set. And you don't even know what happened. You're already interpreting. Some of you are already getting a little annoyed about this scenario because you've been there. And I do that because if you're aware of it, you got a shot at it. So there I am. And because it's been a pretty cool week and I'm a pretty good place and I seem to be practicing a pretty good program of recovery, I see a guy standing up on the corner holding cardboard. And I say to myself, I'm a really fortunate man. I reach in, I pull out my billfold, and I take out a five. And I set it beside me because I think I'm a lucky man, pass it forward, have no idea what this guy's story is. But that's a long line, and it's really hot. <laughs> and, and, yeah, things are getting agitated. And uh, I get a little closer, and I see the sign, and the sign says, uh, need a drink. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Did, your story, you got it? That's your story maker. You're responding. That laughter is an action based on a feeling produced by an interpretation, and you still don't know what's happening. That's how old ideas work. It's unconscious. Here's what the research shows. They call this the crimes of passion, which drives people in the judicial system crazy, because you can tell someone not to do a bad thing and that you're going to put them to death, and it won't stop them. Some of you have that experience. I do as well. So I catch myself putting the five back in my billfold, thinking, I'm not going to do that. To which I said, my God, Ron, you know this guy's story. It's your story. And I open the billfold and I pull out a 20. You're still telling stories. Now you're thinking I'm virtuous. Or maybe you think you're virtuous. What I was was ashamed of my behavior. So I roll up. I look the guy in the eye, say, bless you. Hope everything gets better. Hand him the 20 and and move off. And I I talked with a a guy in recovery later in the day, did a 10th step on this. It was really entertaining to talk it through and to see how we react. Unconsciously, you know, our old ideas fuel this whole cascade of events that we have no control over, which is why it says in the big book, that thing we read every meeting... Many of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. It's true. More true than I ever imagined to be true. So anyway, I'm debriefing with this guy doing this tenth step on it, and here's what we came down to. All we know for sure is there was a guy on a corner 
and I don't have 20 bucks now. <laughs> That's it. All the rest is a story. We don't know. Guy could have got drunk. Guy could have bought food. By the way, people who um, people who typically die of uh, that stage of alcoholism, often it's because of hunger and malnutrition. And so it could be he went and bought a bag full of burgers and it saved his life. Just his life. Who knows? He could have. I don't know. Could have been one of those guys who, yeah, some of you know this. A couple of years ago, a, a, a crack addict um, had some fun with fire underneath an overpass on I-85 in Atlanta and uh, dropped, the, dropped the bridge, right? So like 400,000 cars a day diverted. And someday he's going to be sitting in one of our rooms and he's going to tell that story and people go, God, we tell such lies in here. <laughs> and someone's going to turn and go like, no, he really did do that, right? So anyway, so that's it. We have old ideas. We bump into the world. We tell a story. The story produces feelings. The feelings produce action. No awareness, no opportunity for change. It's instantaneous and it's unconscious. It is true to be. Which means that we're going to have to do something about that. So when we look at that, what Bill was talking about, coming back around to emotional sobriety, was his crippling dependencies were driven by a set of old ideas about what he needed. Things like needing people to validate him. Needing people to tell him he's okay. Needing people to tell him he's doing this great AA deal. And as he says, when that approval didn't come, he fell into crippling depressions. So he coined this phrase, emotional sobriety, and he called it the next frontier. I would like to say that it is my opinion, which you all have some, so take this with a grain of salt. What he was telling us was that there was a place beyond what he called our spiritual kindergarten. If you didn't know this, he told us AA is a spiritual kindergarten, and there's far more we're going to need to learn. That's Bill Wilson talking. But he was pointing us to something beyond don't drink and go to meetings. For me, he was pointing me out beyond the kind of first, fourth step that I did. He was pointing me towards all kinds of things that were the work I was going to have to do. And the place that came out, one of the most brutal periods in my recovery, at uh, somebody shared a story like this. I can't remember which one of you. Or maybe you didn't. I'm just making up a story. Um, I've been known to do that. I was five years sober, and I thought I had this deal figured out. I'd been doing step work. I, I, I had a good program. And a woman showed up on the radar screen. <laughs> yeah, and it was love. <laughs> And at seven or eight years, I discovered, and she is a, I want to be really clear, she is a fine human being. This is not her. This is me doing my dance around who she is. I met my match. I desperately needed her approval. She was unable to provide it. And I, thinking as you were telling your story this morning, I tried every form of manipulation known to man to get her, get her to give me what I knew she knew I needed, because I certainly said it often, and that she was obviously deliberately withholding. And I don't know enough about the her back story to be able to tell you why that is. I can only tell you my experience. This is where something marvelous happens. This is the nexus... Emotional sobriety work is the nexus where Al-Anon, AA, CODA, Love Addicts Anonymous, they all begin to come together. Because it's now no longer about a substance. It's about my interior brokenness. My old ideas that say that I can't be okay unless somebody gives me vast amounts of approval. And it was beautiful because she couldn't do it. And it forced me into despair, which forced me into a seventh step that I had no idea I needed to do. It was the seventh step that said, I am, 
I'm going to kill myself, God. Gee, I need some serious help here. And it took a while. And it included some therapists and some trauma work. If you don't know about that, we could talk for a long, long time. It turns out that lots of us got damaged in child. In fact, Bill wrote a companion letter in 1957 that said, the purpose of the moral inventory is to find out the ways that we have been damaged by life. Let me repeat that. He's no longer talking about the inventory as a, 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 a collection of behaviors and misbehaviors. He says, and this is coincident with him learning about this emotional sobriety stuff, the purpose of the moral inventory is to come to understand how we were damaged by life. I'm innocent. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. Stuff happened to us. That's not to find fault elsewhere. It's to acknowledge what happened which is part of a good adult children's recovery, part of a good Al-Anon recovery, part of a good clear recovery, part of a good recovery across the board is the ability to not blame but to own what, what happened. Not finding fault, owning that it is within me, which is the only solution. And it's not stuff we want to look at. I can't tell you how many times people would say, Ron, maybe you should just not go home and sit on that cushion and rock like you're going to die. Maybe you should just go make coffee somewhere. I tried. It didn't work. I required a whole lot of help to get past, past this stuck place. And the day came when Sam started giving me assignments about how to love without conditions. Which means no conditions. Because I said repeatedly, after a long, 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 long list of things about my wife, I would say, what do you think? And he would say, Ron, love means no conditions. And I would say, well, but what about? And he would say, Ron, love means no conditions. There are no buts. Do you love her? That's it. That's the work. Well, but I got all these needs because it is not about that. Do you love her? Because love means no conditions. It broke me wide open, and the inventory that flowed out of that was amazing. Because it turns out I spend most of my time holding conditions over most people. I just didn't know that's what I did. You want to try this out? Do something a little wonky in one of your favorite meetings and see who spins out. <laughs> I know there's some deep juju mischief in that, but... You all know this has happened to you. Someone sets in your seat, your seat, right? The seat you've been sitting in for God knows how long. And you're out there indignant afterwards saying, don't they? That's my seat. It's been my seat for 22 years. Who do they think they are? I wonder about you. They just sit in the seat. You got a story. And your story got activated. And now you got a resentment. And you think the solution is to get that person to sit somewhere else because that's what we always do. If they'll just be different, this is all going to work far better for me. Which means I am utterly dependent on what they or life does or doesn't do in order for me to have a sustained emotional balance. Which won't work. Because you people just won't do. <laughs> I was talking to somebody about this. Like, well, what are you going to do if people fall asleep? Because it's hot in here. Y'all just ate a bunch of carbs. <laughs> Which means it's giving nap time any minute. Like, well, I'm going to let them snore, and I'm going to watch the person next to them get a resentment. <laughs> and then they're going to go to the coffee room, and they're going to tell their three favorite friends about what a rotten person sat next to them snoring, ruining their workshop. <laughs> Not understanding it's a biological phenomenon. They ate carbs. It's hot in here. They're sleepy. They fall asleep. It's not about me. It's the story about me being inconvenienced that is my problem. And that's predicated on things like, I shouldn't be disturbed. I deserve your respect. I think you ought to have more regard for me. I think I should be important. That's called self-centeredness. I can't let you have your experience without making it about me. I was at a meeting in Austin, Texas, where my sponsor used to live, longtime sponsor used to live, and we were having this particular kind of meeting, and uh, 
And there's a young guy who was so impressed. He opened his mouth, and we were talking about this, about selfish, selfishness and self-centeredness. And he said, man, I'm, he's like a year sober, 21 years old, 22 years old, right, out of the, right off the ranch, right? And anyway, he, he opens his mouth, and he says, I'm so, I'm so troubled now. See, I thought I opened that door for those women. I opened it so that I would look good to those women. He was merely using them to satisfy his need to be seen as a good person. And that meeting blew it up for him. And he had a chance to start looking at his old ideas. So, where does that take us to? For a lot of us, it takes us to work we don't want to do. Because if what I'm proposing, and I urge you to check it out, try it out, hammer it out on the anvil of your experience. One of my spiritual teachers said, if, Ron, if all you do is accept what I or anyone else says, you're cutting yourself short because you shouldn't believe you should learn from your own experience, which is what AA does so, so well. I can tell you my experience. I don't know how you will receive it. It's none of my business. Your experience is none of my business. I learned that because of really terrible sponsorship that I provided to some people. <laughs> Anybody here? Um, let's, see who, let's see who's bold enough to do this. What I found out was that I kept making sponsees recovery about me. Anybody know that story? Yeah, not very many of you are admitting to it. Like, it's not, I don't look so good now, do I? Now my pride has taken a hit. It's deeply disturbing when we begin to see what's really going on inside ourselves. It'll knock you off the beam, which means you got more work to do. And everything in the world is going to encourage you not to go here, except that alcoholism is a subtle foe, and there is some likelihood for many of us that you will reach a point somewhere. Seems to happen a lot between 7 and 15 years. Don't know why that is, but it seems to happen a lot. Some of you are squirming now. I was watching. Where you suddenly realize, just like Dave said, there's just something not right here. And I'm working the steps, and I'm going to meetings, I'm sponsoring, I'm being sponsored, I'm making coffee, and I'm a delegate, and I'm doing all this stuff, and there's something not right. And I'm not criticizing AA now. I want to acknowledge that when we begin to talk about this, people will try and silence you because it makes us uncomfortable because we have to look at things we don't want to look at that don't flatter us. The day, when the day came that I realized that one of my deepest character flaws was that I use people, that didn't show up until 27 years sober. That I am at risk even today of trying to get some complex emotional need met based on whether or not you all walk out of here saying he was the greatest guy ever or the guy's an ass. But you see, I can't put my sobriety at risk based on what you think of me. You got your own deal. Bless you. And again, AA saved my life, but part of what we saw Bill writing about was an acknowledgement that we have blind spots even in long-term recovery. In the eighth step, in the 12 and 12, it says this. Sometimes if we do this work, looking deeply into these relationships, at some points in time, we will see the patterns that underlie our lives. Well, let me tell you how true that is. When you're a guy like me who spent his entire life looking for people to make him important, I got all kinds of relationships across the board, not just romantic ones. I had to sort this out with both my daughters because I thought I was supposed to be important as their dad. And when they didn't give me that importance, I would crash. It's not their job to make me important. They have lives to live. That's self-centeredness. 
my daughter, Brianne, she was really great. She, we got into this one. She was in film school at the time, and she put her hands on her hips. Both of them are small, and man, they're tough. They, uh, I ra- Part of my contribution to their, to their lives was that I insisted that they not be victims because I really find it important what happens to women far too often. So I would tell them, not my daughters. And so they are tough. They take care of themselves. So Brianne put her hands on her hip one day, and she goes, so you know, my life has a plot. <laughs> Just like this, right? She's got tattoos and she's a badass. And uh, she's beautiful and she's soft on the inside anyway. Um, I said, oh, yeah? What's that about? She goes, well, you're not in my plot. <laughs> okay. I'm like, <laughs> she's undermining my importance. Of course I'm in her plot. I'm her dad. She goes, yeah, here's what happens. You stick yourself into my plot and everything goes bad. Because i got to battle you, not my plot. Right? That's my crippling dependencies. The need for my kid to make me okay by validating that I'm an important parent. That causes me to impose in her life in ways that damage her life and her path. And it's self-centeredness. Because I want to believe that I'm that big a deal. That's an old idea. It goes all the way back to my infancy. Because when we trace this stuff back, what I found, and I know some of you don't want to hear this. Some of you are going to say, it's not about your childhood. Oh, yeah, it is. The research is getting really... One of my clients does a whole lot of work in this space. Let me tell you, the research says that in the first five years of life, you were basically cooked. And so the stuff you're struggling with today was formed in the first five years of your life based on the family, the community, and circumstances in which you emerged. The single largest predictor of your life outcomes is the zip code you're born into. Because the place you're born determines whether or not you get nurturance or not, and lack of nurturance causes damage. Let me tell you how I know that. I sponsored a guy who was adopted out at birth in West Texas. Um, we would find out later his mama did that because she knew she couldn't take care of him. It was an act of love, but from him it was an act of abandonment. And at that point in time, they stuck stuck babies in incubators and didn't touch them or anything, which is just devastating to babies. We now know. So he developed this deep and profound um, attachment disorder, would be the technical language for it. Um, I work in some of that field, so I know a little bit about some of these things. Anyway, His inventory eventually took him down to understand that his whole history in substance abuse, because he included more than alcohol, was a story about that brokenness that had to be healed. Every relationship, every single relationship. Nobody's guilty. But until he started doing that work, all he could do was produce relational train wrecks. Because everything was an opportunity to be abandoned which was devastating to him because it triggered things in him he didn't even know were in there, which sounds like psychological work, doesn't it? Well, okay, page 133 in the book has a paragraph that Sam used to say is the paragraph most often discounted in a room of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the one that says we should avail ourselves of professional help. (laughs) One of my great teachers said, Ron, You're going to need a sponsor with a black belt in the steps. You're going to need a therapist with a black belt in therapy. And you're going to need a spiritual advisor with a black belt in spirituality. Because you're pretty twisted. Which is a true statement. So the result of all this is we can go beneath the behaviors all the way down to the stuff that fuels the behaviors. The old ideas that set us up for those decisions based on self which place us in a position to be harmed or to harm others. And the steps work on that. It's a different kind of fourth step. It's a different kind of tenth step. So let me tell you how that might work. I'm actually going to walk through one here. The fastest way, and this is part of what's in the handout too, the, uh, the fastest way to get at this stuff is to do what's called an expectations inventory. And there's like three pieces. And for those of you who want to read it, you can read it and all that. I'm going to walk you through it. Here's how an expectations inventory works. There are three pieces of expectations, which are old ideas. We just don't know it. What am I expecting of the other person? What am I expecting of me? What am I expecting of the relationship? That's it. Except it's not that simple because it's not so clear. 
So somebody came up to me after one of these, because I do a bunch of emotional sobriety workshops, and uh, a woman came up to me and she says, so, so is it a realistic expect expectation to not have my boyfriend hit me? And I said, well, not if he's not able to not hit you. If he's that guy, the problem is you're involved with him. Thinking he's going to change is a bad plan. Maybe he will, maybe he won't, don't know. We heard some powerful stories last night, this morning, about people being transformed. And I, I get it, people are transformed, but I would not be betting on it. Way too many aren't. So these problems with bosses and siblings and neighbors and coworkers and you just go down the long walk. They're all relationships. And here's the fun part. Any place you're struggling, you have an expectation that is a mismatch with reality. Sounds a lot like column four of the inventory. What am I bringing to this? And if you go back to that passage that people either love or hate, the acceptance passage which you may not know was actually written by him, the writer, about his relationship to his wife, Max, who he used to love and find adorable, but had then found himself in, in deep judgment of her. It's a beautiful, beautiful story about relationship. That story's not about alcoholism. It's about relationship and alcoholism. And he was long time in recovery. And what he proceeds to tell us is acceptance is the key to all of my problems today. I'm shifting that and saying acceptance is what happens when we let go or have removed our expectations. So what does that look like? Well, let me tell you a few stories. It's not uncommon to find out that women in recovery have some expectations about men being available to them. Well, that caused a reaction. <laughs> some men don't do that so well. Some men do. If you want someone to, you know, pay attention to you, pick someone who can pay attention to you. Don't pick someone who won't and try and get it to be different. Bad plan. It's not uncommon for men to think that women exist to serve some of their sexual needs. Let me tell you a really interesting story that came out in an inventory. A guy married a woman. They had very, very different sex drives. The one thought that sex six days a week was a good idea. The other was utterly average at 1.5 times a week. You can look that up. That's data. <laughs> and the problem was someone who doesn't like much sex expects the other person to have their sexual needs met some other way, which is a design for all kinds of interesting challenges. And the reverse is also true. The person with high sex drive wants the person with low sex drive to want more sex. Here's the funny part. She was the high sex drive. He was the low sex drive. I know you didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> And he told me, in the midst of a very, very in intimate inventory, he said, Ron, I just can't do it that often. I mean, I've tried. My heart is not it. Well, more than my heart is not in it. <laughs> I mean, they're literally biologically different creatures. And in the fourth step in the, in in the big book, it says that in the end, nobody gets to be an arbiter of our sex lives except for higher power. So I got no business having any opinion about anybody else's sexual interests. But if I have an expectation about what they are or aren't supposed to do, that's a train wreck in the making. Usually because what I will do is start trying to get them to be different, which is a really bad strategy. I'm predicating my well-being in the relationship with my boss, my coworker, my kids, my neighbor, go down the long, long list, sponsees. AA meetings. Anybody here ever have resentments at your AA meetings? Come on. Okay. You're normal. <laughs> the only reasonable expectation is an expectation that is likely to be met by the circumstances on the other side. If it's not, it's your work to do, not theirs. That's your inventory. That's your old idea set. That's my old idea set. That's my 10th step. That's my 7th step. 
because I'm going to need serious spiritual help letting go of that stuff, which is forgiveness work, which is the only thing that works. But it's at seventh step because some stuff in me has got to get worked with because I can't fix this stuff. Sam used to say it's like, it's like a stain that runs through marble. It's part of the marble. And when it's elevated, when it's made right, it's beautiful. So what's it look like on the other side? Way too often, we have expectations of ourselves. I learned this one because I emotionally abused my daughters in sobriety. And I tell that story, A, because some of you out there are, you have your own challenges. I know you have those challenges because we don't clean up and stop drinking and suddenly stop acting badly in our families. Somebody said that in their story. Some of the hardest work I did in recovery was having to own that I could not stop emotionally abusing Natalie and Brianne. And I was long time sober, working steps, doing the deal. There was some damage inside of me. I felt way too responsible for them. And I failed so often. It was... It was devastatingly clear to me that I was incapable of being the man I wanted to be. That no amount of willpower, because I got old ideas deep within me that need serious seventh step work. But I can't do seventh step work till I know I got the old ideas and expectations down there. And I'd talk about that in meetings, and people would come up and say, you probably should have talk with this with your therapist. And I said, oh, you mean like both of them? <laughs> you got a sponsor? Yeah, we talk about it too. To which I said, if I can't talk about that in these rooms, I'm screwed. I've got to find a place to talk about. Maybe it's a men's me. I don't know. Maybe it's a small, intimate group. But I've got to talk about the terribly un... We are so hard on ourselves. One of the hardest pieces of forgiveness work is to forgive ourselves. We heard that story last night. That forgiveness can be offered and we sometimes cannot receive. My daughter Natalie told me that one day when I made amend number 1,487. And she said, when are you going to get over this? I'm so done with this. When will you be? So she let me off the hook, but I couldn't let me off the hook. Why? Because I'm self-centered and I think I should be that guy who's able... It's humbling when you realize you can't fix yourself, but that's the seventh step. If I'm powerless, I'm not in charge of my repair because I can't repair me. If I could repair me, I don't need you. I don't need this. I don't need the steps. It's not a behavioral improvement program. It's an internal reformation program. And sometimes our expectations of relationship are very faulty. Some of us think relationships should provide us with comfort or safety or financial support. I'm not saying any one of those things is wrong. All I'm saying is my favorite one. You know, someone ends up with somebody who's financially irresponsible, right, undermining their financial well-being, and all they want to do is get the other person to stop their gambling habit or their spending habit. It's an addiction. You get to decide. Do you want to be in a relationship with someone who undermines your financial well-being? You going to make some alternative financial plans? You going to go find another relationship? Do the work first, though, because you'll probably find one more who will do the same thing. <laughs> you ever wonder about that? Somebody said this. It's like I used to, when I thought that dating sites were a good idea, I would... Uh, <laughs> You know, you go through and you scroll through like a hundred and you pick one and then you meet them for lunch and you go like, how did I find another alcoholic? <laughs> I thought it was soup and salad. I knew it was going to be four martini lunch for her. <laughs> over and over again. So until you get the healing work done, somehow or another we keep finding ourselves there. Until the old idea is released, the old idea just perpetuates itself over and over again because it's our reality. I was listening to a guy tell his story one Friday night at a conference, and uh, he talked about how when he was uh, when he was uh, a kid, there were always fire trucks and ambulances and all that showing up on his in his front yard. So he that was his reality while he was drinking as an adult, and then he quit drinking, and all the fire trucks and ambulances stopped showing up. He said, "Happy, joyous, and free." 
He said, I have no idea how much I did not know. That was a way station along the way. There was still a whole lot of damage inside me that had to be repaired because I just found other forms of train wrecks. Just didn't involve fire trucks and ambulances, which is the story of my recovery over and over again. At some point, I sent myself, well, 17 years sober. I called Sam up one day and I said, you were right. He said, what was I right about? And I said, 10 years ago, you told me I would need to go off for inpatient treatment on for love addiction and codependency. And you're right. And I just signed up. I'm going. I can't ruin one more relationship. And he said, well, Ron, we wouldn't want to rush things now, would we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I tell that story because you need to know that a guy who's done really good recovery work finds himself needing to check in and do inpatient work for a week to clean up some debris from his life because there were damages I couldn't get at through the usual means. I needed serious professional help, and I got it. I didn't know that I needed trauma treatment because of damage in my childhood, and lots of us have it. And you can't inventory your way out of that stuff. It's experiential. We need professional help, many of us. Some of you don't. For those of you who don't need it, not, yay. Yay. If you didn't have some bad juju on, in your childhoods, your family systems, your history, which, by the way, runs all the way up until we put the drink and drug down, and then some of the carnage stops. So let me, let me say just a little bit um, to wrap this thing up. There is no solution outside of ourselves. Whatever you think you need or want, it's not out there. The big book is clear on this. Somewhere deep down inside every man and woman is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by pomp, circumstance, and the worship of other things, but somewhere down in there, it is there. That's a second step problem. Emotional sobriety work asks only that you go looking for your column for stuff, expectations, old ideas, decisions based on self, which have placed you in a position to be harmed. That's all it asks of you. But it asks much of you because you're going to have to look in places you'd prefer not to. And I, I don't want to scare you away. But I don't want to lie to you. I mean, if you're relatively new in recovery, you're thinking, Jesus. <laughs> Which some of you might be. See, I don't know. You may... Psh, your deal may line up beautifully and simply, and God bless you for that. On the other hand, you're just as likely to be someone who's going to have a story like mine where much will be asked of you, and the only reason you will do it is because I cannot ever pick up a drink again. And what I saw by not doing emotional sobriety work was that I was either going to kill myself or get loaded. Or I was going to do that work. I did not come to it out of virtue, out of intelligence, out of education. Nothing special about me. I got cornered. And I got pummeled and tenderized until I said, okay, here's the sound of a seventh step. Okay. Do me. Don't care. I don't care anymore. That's the sound of what on page 164, the language is abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Abandoning is not surrendering. We try and surrender things we want. We abandon things we are done with. And if we're not done with it, we just can't let it go. That's the story of surrenders that backfire. You all know this story. You hear it all the time. Means I give it up. I take it back. Claw marks. But we can't understand that until we dig deeply into this column four work around emotional sobriety. It just won't, it just won't yield. I don't know why that is. We heard, I don't know why that is. That's just my experience. So let me tell you just um, one more thing. Well, one more thing, one story, and then I'm done. This changes the way we do fourth and fifth and tenth steps. We're no longer looking for what we did wrong. We're looking for the causes of what was wrong. Somewhere deep down inside ourselves. And it's not in an extended column two. Do you all know what that is? That's where you talk for years about the person and why they're the problem. <laughs> I did that. There's no solution there. That's why Sam got annoyed with me and said, do you love her? To which I said, 
but. <laughs> so the nature of the inventory has to be different. We do have to ask why. Maybe not in your first fourth step, maybe not in your first year. If you're 30 days sober, just like, you know, tuck this away and deal with it in 10 years. Uh, on the other hand, if you've got a sponsor who is up for helping you do some of that work or can coach you to find therapeutic support, by golly, do it. The stuff does not go away. You don't put the plug in the jug and suddenly get all this brokenness inside you healed by virtue of not drinking. What it does is it metastasizes and begins to show up in the strangest ways, and then the next thing you know, you have another addiction problem. And you let go of that one, you have another addiction problem. Until that deeper, inner, long-term, restorative step work takes place. So if this is daunting to you, let me tell you why I do this. I do this because without this deeper work, I would not be here. I do this because over and over again, I was talking with Angie um, earlier, before she spoke. And I said, I spend a lot of time now with people who show up and say, I'm stuck, Ron. I don't know what the hell to do. I'm stuck. I'm scared. Something's not right. I said, okay, let's talk. The steps work on that. I do it because of a friend who I won't name, who um, showed up in a workshop when she was 29 years sober. And she practiced in the field. She was a therapist. And she told me, she told the group, she said, I'm here because I'm deep in despair. I'm 29 years sober. I'm a practicing therapist. I've done this deal. And something is just not right. And I don't know what it is, and I don't know what to do about it. Well, that opened up a remarkable space for her because she'd finally told the truth. And you all know this. Once you tell the truth, spirit begins to move. It took her five years. She's now 34 years sober. And she, she sent me a note recently. And she said, I want to thank you. And I sort of glibly said back to her electronically, oh, yeah? What fun stuff is this? And she said, Ron, this deal changed me. And I said, okay. So now you can hear me being knocked off my glib pedestal. And I said, how did it change you? She said, for 33 years, I've been holding on to suicide as my final option. That if in the end, I can't be restored, I will kill myself. What? But I no longer think that thought. It is gone. Because I have been restored by something, to quote Robert from this morning, something that I do not understand and cannot explain, but the steps did that. So I will close with this. Wherever you're stuck, the steps work on that because they're principles backed by a higher power. The only question is what's the nature of our stuckness and are we willing to do that work? Rest assured spirit moves. No question in my experience. So let me tell you the most powerful prayer that I have at this point in my recovery. It's an affirmative prayer. For those of you who don't know if affirmation or affirmative prayer, what it means is I'm not asking for anything. I'm acknowledging. And it's very simple. Thank you, higher power, that my well-being is not dependent on anything or anyone. Ever. Thank you. That my well-being is not dependent on anyone or anything ever. So it is, so it shall be, and you, my dear friends, are responsible for me having the experience I've just shared. I can't ever pay that debt. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.